If most people are asked, who ended the Wars of the Roses and how? You will normally get the answer, King Henry VII, when he won the Battle of Bosworth. But he could not have done it alone. And one person was not merely helpful in creating stability in England by Henry's side, but was integral to it. His wife and queen, Elizabeth of York. Elizabeth was the eldest daughter and first child in a new line of Yorkist royalty. Her father, Edward IV, had won the throne through a combination of his father being designated heir by Parliament, being better at the job than Henry VI, and winning the right battles. Her mother, Elizabeth Woodville, was born into gentry despite her mother being nobility, and as such, was looked down upon by several at court. Young Princess Elizabeth was therefore a hope for cementing the new dynasty and a symbol of an attempt at stability for England, especially remembering that everyone would have hoped for a boy before she arrived. She was born on the 11th of February 1466, the first princess born to an English monarch in over a century. Her christening was a magnificent affair, held at Westminster Abbey and no expense spared. Her sponsors were her grandmothers, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, the Duchess of Bedford, and Cecily Neville, the Duchess of York, and her cousin, Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick. Edward IV gave his wife a jewel that cost £125, around £65,500 in today's money, to mark the occasion of little Elizabeth's birth. In a way, it was unsurprising at the opulence surrounding her birth and christening, as England was a wealthy country at the time. Little was imported except for wine, and exports of tin and wool ensured a thriving economy under her father's rule. As was normal for a medieval royal family, the court was transient in nature, and Elizabeth's parents would have spent their time between several royal residences, at least around 12 or so. Little Elizabeth would have therefore been used to moving around from a very young age, although most of her family's palaces were in London or nearby, and she would have grown up to know the city of London intimately. But it was relationships within the court itself that would have a profound effect on Elizabeth's life. The Earl of Warwick, the kinsman of Edward IV, competed for dominance against the Queen's family, the Woodvilles. Warwick, a born nobleman and having fought alongside Edward's father, saw himself as the natural right-hand advisor to the new king. But Queen Elizabeth was proving, while she wasn't born a princess, she was a capable consort. She was pious and careful with her funds, charitable, and she earned the love and trust of her husband, especially as she turned a blind eye to many of his affairs. This meant Edward trusted her and her family with a large amount of influence, and many of the Woodvilles were placed into prominent positions of power. But Princess Elizabeth wasn't to be an only child, and she was to have nine other siblings. When her younger sister Mary was born in August 1467, in October Edward granted his eldest daughter the manor of Great Linford in Buckingham for life. In reality, she only had the property until 1474 when it was sold, but the rent would have helped pay for her childhood household. Elizabeth and some of her siblings lived at Sheen Palace in Surrey as a nursery, living in a separate household from her parents. This was a normal medieval practice amongst royalty. It showed both how extravagant they could afford to be by having separate households for their children, and it allowed them to be kept away from London's propensity towards plagues and illnesses. The children would have had meals that included bread and ale, but also meat, fish and butter, and inspiring and moral tales would be read out to them during mealtimes. Their household also included a page to wait on them and a knight of the trencher. As might be expected, little Elizabeth led a privileged life. 
At the time Elizabeth was born, education for girls leaned more towards honesty and moral perfection, and this prevailed over academia. However, slowly, society in England was beginning to shift to the idea a woman could be both virtuous and educated. Young Elizabeth would be lucky enough to become one of these educated princesses, and her father especially encouraged her love of books having collected his own impressive collection of manuscripts and books himself. She was able to read and write in English, and she also understood French, but struggled to converse in it. Alongside this, Elizabeth and her sisters were taught dancing, horse riding, music and needlework. Even royal girls, however, would have been raised to consider themselves the weaker sex, and that the most honourable state for a woman to aspire to was to be successfully married. There also would have been an acceptance that parents, who were to be obeyed until a husband could be obeyed, would choose a suitable husband. For princesses, this was even more important, as marriages, never really about love in the Middle Ages, could be used for political and economic gain for their country. Elizabeth was no different. Facing turmoil and challenges to his rule from the Earl of Warwick and his own brother, George Duke of Clarence, Edward needed to bolster himself with friends. Edward created Warwick's brother, John Neville, as Marquess of Montague and offered Elizabeth's hand in marriage to John's five-year-old son, George. On the 5th of January 1470, the betrothal was made official, and Edward also created the young boy Duke of Bedford. However, it's unlikely this was ever a serious marriage proposal, rather than a hasty political solution to an emergency situation. Just a few months later in September, Edward was forced to flee to Burgundy when Warwick turned their dispute into a revolt, and Elizabeth went with her mother and sisters into the safety of Westminster Abbey. Her brother, the first and eldest son born to the king, would be born in Westminster while Edward was in exile. He himself would be called Edward after his father. Edward would return the following year from exile, and once again the royal family was able to return to court. Louis XI had encouraged Warwick, but eventually, peace would be found between England and France. In 1475, young Elizabeth was then promised to the French Dauphin, Charles, later to be Charles VIII, which Louis XI agreed to. However, by 1482, the betrothal was called off because it was no longer in France's interests. It is interesting to think on what Elizabeth's thoughts on marriage were. As she grew up, she would have been increasingly aware of her father's indiscretions as well as her mother's calm acceptance of them, although it's likely her mother didn't like it. While there are hints that young Elizabeth would share much of her father's personality, enjoying good food, grand display and fine clothes, she would be faithful to her future husband, Henry VII. On the 9th of April, 1483, Elizabeth would suffer the first of many tragedies to come, as her father Edward died suddenly at the age of 40. He was succeeded by his 12-year-old son Edward, now Edward V. In his will, Elizabeth's father stated that she was to be left 10,000 marks, around £1.5 million in today's money, if she married the person her mother and brother deemed best. If she didn't, she didn't get the money. Edward IV's dying wish was apparently for his youngest brother, Richard Duke of Gloucester, to be protector of his son. However, the Woodvilles understood perfectly what would happen if Richard, who they had never got on with, had control of the king. They would lose their power and possibly even have young Edward turned against them. Elizabeth Woodville tasked her brother Anthony Woodville and her son from her first marriage, Thomas Gray, to fetch Edward V to London. However, Richard intercepted them at Stony Stratford and took Edward under his care, separating Anthony and Thomas from him and sending them to Pontefract Castle, 
where they were later executed for supposedly plotting against the young king. Fearing the worst, the elder Elizabeth took her daughters and youngest son, Richard of Shrewsbury, and went into sanctuary at Westminster Abbey. What happened next is one of the greatest mysteries of the Middle Ages. Richard had Edward V and his younger brother Richard of Shrewsbury placed into the Tower of London to await a coronation that never happened. Instead, the boys were declared illegitimate and their uncle became Richard III, King of England. Not long after, the two boys were no longer seen at the Tower and it's presumed they were killed or may possibly have escaped to Europe, although this is much less likely. While Dowager Queen Elizabeth would never have proof either way, rumours reached her that her sons were likely dead. Polydore Virgil gives an account of Elizabeth Woodville beating her breast, tearing out her hair and screaming her children's names, cursing herself as a madwoman for believing her son would be safe and delivering her youngest boy to the man who was most likely his murderer. All of this must have been traumatic for the young Princess Elizabeth, who was now 17. Not only had she been separated from her brothers, not only was her father and protector dead, but now her brothers were likely dead as well, and she must have understood this was happening because her mother and her mother's family were disliked by the man who had now taken the throne. To know she was considered part of that faction must have been terrifying, and no doubt she worried not only for her own life, but also for that of her siblings and her mother. And on top of this, Elizabeth Woodville's reaction must have been terrifying to watch and understand. There was also fear about the future. This time, there would be no Edward IV returning to rescue them, and feeding from her mother, Elizabeth would likely have been anxious and grieving. After a while, exacerbated by merchants who sold to those in sanctuary at extremely high prices, Elizabeth and her family were running low on funds, and they had to rely on the charity of the abbot. But there may have been a plan in the works. Polydor Virgil also tells us how Elizabeth Woodville and Margaret Beaufort, mother of the later Henry VII, made contact with one another through their shared physician. An agreement was made that Margaret would provide money and resources and Elizabeth would use her network to provide supporters, and so Henry Tudor, Margaret's son, would be brought home from his exile in Brittany and France to take the crown from Richard. But there was a condition, that Henry be given the hand of Elizabeth of York in marriage, using her rightful claim to the throne to bolster his own weak claim through John of Gaunt and his right by conquest. Henry didn't have much to offer in return at this stage with no title and no lands, but he could offer the one thing Elizabeth Woodville craved more than anything, revenge, in the form of Henry being able to raise an army against Richard III. She agreed to the marriage. It's unknown whether Margaret had secretly harboured thoughts of Henry claiming the throne after Edward's death, or if it was something that came about later, but the idea was certainly formalised at this time. She had previously tried to petition Edward for Henry's return to England, and after he died, Margaret attempted the same with Richard. She asked if Henry could return to England, as well as to the title from his father, the Earl of Richmond, and even if he could marry one of Edward's daughters. This request had been ignored entirely. No doubt the younger Elizabeth, while possibly not privy to all details, would have known a lot about this. Not only was she old enough for her mother to confide in her, but the plan itself involved her marriage, and it's likely the Dowager Queen would have discussed this with her. However, something that is never mentioned is whether or not Elizabeth considered herself to be the rightful monarch of England in the wake of her brother's disappearance. While it is true there hadn't yet been a female regnant in England, 
it wasn't an unprecedented idea. In England itself in the 12th century, Empress Matilda had been proclaimed her father's heir to the throne, and contemporary to the Wars of the Roses was a female Queen of the Scots, Mary of Gelders, who was also well-liked. It's not impossible this thought may have stayed somewhere in the back of Princess Elizabeth's mind. Therefore, marrying Henry was probably also her best chance at being on the throne of England. Word of the proposed marriage between Henry Tudor and Princess Elizabeth spread amongst Yorkist supporters, who had been horrified at Edward IV's children being put to one side, and they readily joined the side of Henry, ironically, a man from the House of Lancaster. Unfortunately, the first attempt at rebellion failed in October 1483, and the conspirators would be set back until August 1485. But in December of 1483, Henry went to Rennes Cathedral on Christmas Day and publicly announced his intention to marry Elizabeth of York as soon as he was king. It was throwing down a double gauntlet, and it united both those from the houses of Lancaster and York, many of whom swore homage to him in the cathedral that morning. But in the meantime, Richard realised he had to change tack. Elizabeth of York was now seen as a politically important woman, and having the Woodvilles hide from him in Westminster Abbey only made Richard look more guilty. He invited Elizabeth Woodville and her daughters back to court, but at first she understandably refused. After much coercion, promises and threats, Richard had to publicly declare in front of his council that he wouldn't harm the Woodvilles and that he would find suitable marriages for Elizabeth's daughters to gentlemen. Not the best for princesses, but perhaps the best expected in the circumstances. In a document that confirmed this, it is notable that there is no mention of the safety of the two princes, suggesting without a doubt Richard knew they were dead. The practical reality is that the Dowager Queen had little choice but to agree and return her girls to court. For her daughters, anger at Richard III and worry about their mother likely mixed with relief at finally being back out in the public world. But by Christmas 1484, rumours were starting again. This time, of Richard considering a marriage to his niece, Elizabeth of York. His wife, Queen Anne, was severely ill at this point, and many made something of the fact Elizabeth could be compared in looks with Anne. The only child of Anne and Richard, Edward of Midlam, had died in April, and Richard now had no heir. The rumours grew bad enough that once again, Richard had to make a public proclamation, this time that he had no interest in marrying his niece. Elizabeth of York was then placed at Sheriff Hutton Castle, but none of it would matter by August of the following year. Henry finally made his move and invaded in July, meeting Richard's forces just outside the town of Market Bosworth. With help from Welsh soldiers and the army brought by his stepfather, Thomas Stanley, Earl of Derby, Henry was victorious and he killed Richard III on the battlefield. Henry was now Henry VII, King of England. Now, Elizabeth simply had to wait for him to come through on his promise. She didn't have long to wait for the good news. Henry sent messengers immediately to Sheriff Hutton Castle to ensure she was kept safe and tell her the good news, as well as taking her to her mother, Elizabeth Woodville, in London. But Henry wanted to establish himself as having enough claim in his own right to be king without needing to lean on his future bride's bloodline, and so the wedding wasn't hurried. He first had his claim by conquest confirmed by Parliament, adding weight to his weak claim through his mother to John of Gaunt, which was already complex because technically his line from John of Gaunt couldn't claim the throne anyway. 
but the last few decades had proven that being born to the right family was no certain way to hold a throne, so it helped. But it was marriage to Elizabeth that truly would provide the stability for Henry's claim to the crown. He and his mother, Margaret Beaufort, were from the House of Lancaster, and the main reason Yorkists, discontented with Richard, had rallied to Henry was because of his proposed marriage to the Yorkist heir, Elizabeth of York. Despite wanting to hold the claim in his own right, Henry did recognise that he couldn't do it alone, and finally, the planning began. First, he had to revoke Titulus Regis, the document Richard had pushed through to claim all Edward IV's children were illegitimate. Without removing this document, Elizabeth was not technically a legitimate heir. Removing Titulus Regis also shows Henry, like most other people at the time, truly believed Edward V and Richard of Shrewsbury were dead, as otherwise their claim would have superseded his own when proclaiming them legitimate once more. Two papal dispensations were sent for as Elizabeth and Henry were related to John of Gaunt and his younger brother Edmund of Langley, a local one and one to Rome. The one from Rome confirming the marriage took months to arrive, finally reaching England in March 1486, but the more local dispensation was adhered to first, given in January of the same year. Elizabeth and Henry did meet before their wedding, however. Shortly after his victory, Henry came to see Elizabeth at the Tower of London where she was staying with her mother, although little is written of their first meeting. It's likely that Henry, who could apparently be charming and witty, but also cautious and careful, showed a more reserved side of himself. He had no idea how much Elizabeth had been involved in the possibility of marrying Richard III and she represented the old enemy, the House of York. But by all accounts, Elizabeth was pleasant and cheerful with him. There were other meetings after this, as Henry stayed nearby at his mother's property of Cold Harbour for a few weeks, and affection seems to have sprung up between the couple. Elizabeth stated she had come to feel great and intimate love and cordial affection for Henry, and during Michaelmas, Henry sent Elizabeth a gift of damask, furs and crimson velvet. On the 18th of January, Elizabeth and Henry finally wed at Westminster. It was a magnificent celebration, with nobles from the House of York and Lancaster filling the seats. Elizabeth was dressed in silk damask and crimson satin, covered with a white cloth of gold kirtle, trimmed with ermine, as well as decked out in sumptuous jewels. It would leave no doubt that the rumours of being illegitimate were not to be thought of. Elizabeth was presented as a princess, becoming a rightful queen consort. The wedding was celebrated up and down the land by a joyful English people. Bonfires were lit, poems were written, songs were sung, and banquets were held throughout London. Over the course of their marriage, a deep and binding love would grow between Elizabeth and Henry. Waking up the next morning, it may now have dawned on Elizabeth that she was finally queen consort and all that came with it. She now had to be not only her husband's wife, but the highest example of womanhood in the land. The most virtuous, charitable and humble woman, while also supporting Henry as king and providing him with heirs. To today's society, this doesn't sound very freeing, but it did come with some wiggle room. While late medieval women were barred from many aspects of life and marriage was rarely equal, there were still ways to wield power. Charitable works, patronage, having the ear of the king and being political behind the scenes were ways in which a queen could be powerful in her own right. Elizabeth's understanding of her role can be seen in her personal emblem and motto. The motto she chose was humble and reverent, suggesting she knew her place was to be a queenly figure while also being a helpmeet for Henry. 
but her personal device was to be the White Rose of the House of York, which shows she also understood her own importance to the throne of England and as heiress to the House of York. It wouldn't be long before Elizabeth helped to stabilise the throne that balanced on both Henry and herself as she fell pregnant shortly after they were married. The speed with which she had become pregnant must have seemed to everyone a sign that the marriage was divinely approved. By September of that year, Elizabeth was heavily pregnant with their first child and the place of the birth would be just as important as whether it was a boy or a girl. She was sent to St. Swithin's Priory in Winchester, now known as Winchester Cathedral, as at the time, Winchester was assumed to be the Camelot of Arthurian legends, something Henry was keen to associate his family with, especially as he himself claimed descent from King Arthur. Childbirth was a difficult and painful process for women in the medieval period, while midwives of the time did have some knowledge that looks surprisingly modern, such as herbal baths in the later stages of pregnancy and breathing exercises to help with labour, much hope was put in prayers to saints and the Virgin Mary. The rate of death for women giving birth was so high that the average first marriage was just five years long. Elizabeth would undergo this terrifying process seven times. In the early hours of the morning just after midnight on the 20th of September 1486, Elizabeth gave birth to a boy. Henry decreed his son would be named Prince Arthur after his famous supposed ancestor and although he was a month early, he was strong and healthy. The young boy was the hope of many. Seen as the union of the houses of Lancaster and York, the glittering beginning for the Tudor dynasty, and as a boy, the future King of England. As was normal for royal women of the time, Elizabeth would have handed Arthur over to his own household rather than taking care of his daily needs herself. In order to allow her to conceive more quickly, queens did not breastfeed in order to allow their periods to return faster, and Elizabeth would also have to return to ceremonial functions and duties. In the 15th century, good royal mothers ensured their children had a good education, a good household of staff, and later to organise a good marriage. However, after giving birth, Elizabeth was described as having contracted a fever that persisted throughout her lying-in period. This fever would persist for the next few months, and the gap of time between her pregnancies may suggest her ill health affected her very badly. When she finally recovered, she gave a large gift of money to the priory where she had given birth in thanks for her health returning. She also set to work, along with her mother-in-law Margaret Beaufort, in shaping the style and appearance of the court, something which Henry had little knowledge of as he had spent so many years abroad. On the 25th of November, 1487, Elizabeth was finally crowned as Queen Consort of England in a lavish ceremony at Westminster Abbey. She wore a luxurious kirtle and gown of purple velvet and a circlet of golden pearls on her head, her hair loose for the occasion as queens were allowed to do even after marriage. As she passed along the runner to her coronation, however, people stepped forward eagerly behind her to snip off pieces of the material she had walked on. This was a prerogative of the common people and such a souvenir would have been priceless. Unfortunately, the crowd was too forceful and the ladies behind Elizabeth carrying her train were disordered and some people were killed in the crush. It must have been horrible to know the chaos that was happening behind her and yet being ushered into her ceremony at the same time. Nevertheless, the rest of the coronation went without a hitch, Henry and his mother Margaret allowing Elizabeth to take centre stage as they watched from behind a latticed screen. The coronation was followed by a grand banquet of over 51 dishes. Elizabeth would then have settled once again into courtly life, 
Although she had ceremonial duties, she also would have been expected to do other activities that all women were expected to do, such as embroidering and mending and embellishing clothes. It was Elizabeth who embroidered Henry's King's Garter robe with gold thread, and she employed a French embroiderer named Robinet, who received wages and board. Making items such as shirts, hangings or bedding could be given at New Year's as gifts. Much of her time would also have been spent in trying on and changing into various items of this clothing. As royalty, Elizabeth and Henry were expected to be the best dressed of anyone at court in order to outwardly show their family's prosperity and rank. Despite his reputation as a miser, Henry actually spent lavishly on gifts for his wife and children and he ensured the more expensive items required for her wardrobe were provided by himself to ease Elizabeth's own finances. Elizabeth's ladies-in-waiting would also have been expected to dress almost as well and expensively as she did, and it could be a significant amount of a family's income that went into paying for a woman to be a lady-in-waiting. She was also a great patron of the arts, and Elizabeth never lost her love for books, giving large funds to William Caxton for his printing press. She also loved to give generously to charity, and it was her custom when travelling to distribute alms to the people she passed. Elizabeth also regularly made offerings to saints and shrines. A few months later, Elizabeth was again pregnant. This time, she would give birth to a daughter, Margaret, named for her paternal grandmother and born on the 28th of November. But the joy and happiness at another royal child would be dampened the following year with a yet another royal pretender, Perkin Warbeck. He claimed in 1490 at the court of Burgundy to be Richard of Shrewsbury, Elizabeth's younger lost brother. And his similar looks and charming manners soon meant the royal courts of Europe saw an opportunity to use him for their own ends. Ultimately, after more than one attempt to invade England, Perkin was captured in October 1497 by Henry's forces. Henry was initially lenient with Perkin, allowing him to not only reside in the Tower of London but to occasionally appear at court, as well as placing Perkin's wife into Elizabeth of York's household. After Perkin tried a disastrous attempt at escape with the real Earl of Warwick, however, Henry had him executed on the 23rd of November, 1499. Little is written of what Elizabeth thought about Perkin, but it's likely she met him in passing at court. If he ever really resembled her lost brother, she never noted it down. Elizabeth would go on to have five more children, Prince Henry, who would grow up to become the infamous Henry VIII, born on the 28th of June 1491, a daughter named Elizabeth after her own mother, who was born on the 2nd of June 1492, but sadly died while still a toddler, Princess Mary, born on the 18th of March 1496, who would become the grandmother of Lady Jane Grey, Edmund, Duke of Somerset, who was born on the 21st of February 1499, but died while still a baby the following year, and her final pregnancy was Catherine, born on the 2nd of February 1503, who would live only a few days. It's clear that as the years went on and Elizabeth went through successive pregnancies, it began to take its toll on her body especially in a period without modern medicine. But as the children grew older, it also fell to Elizabeth to help organise their marriages, especially for her eldest son, Arthur. In the late 1490s, she began correspondence with Queen Isabella of Castile to open negotiations for Arthur to marry Isabella's daughter Catherine, later to be known in England as Catherine of Aragon. On the 14th of November 1501, Catherine and Arthur were married. They set up home in Ludlow Castle, the traditional home of the Prince of Wales, and they seemed to care for one another. But their happiness, and that of Elizabeth and Henry, was not to last. 
Just a few months later, in the spring of 1502, the young couple both fell ill, possibly with either plague, a viral infection, or the dreaded sweating sickness. On the 2nd of April, Arthur, the hope for the Tudor dynasty and heir to the throne, died. Henry was inconsolable, both for the loss of his beloved son and his worries about his dynasty now he only had one son to continue after him. There is an account that gives a glimpse into the relationship between Elizabeth and Henry in the wake of their son's death. Henry apparently sent for the Queen to tell her the news himself and broke down in front of her. Elizabeth was selfless, comforting the King, reminding him that he was the only child of his mother, that he still had another son and two daughters, and that they were both still young enough to have more children. This last part was probably more to simply comfort them than being the truth, however. She held in her own grief, only collapsing in tears when she got to her own chambers. Elizabeth's attendants called for the king and he came immediately, this time comforting her, reminding Elizabeth of the wise advice she had given him. It is a touching story that, even if embellished, shows this was a marriage built on mutual love and understanding. Sadly, more tragedy was yet to come and Henry would bear this one alone. In 1502, Elizabeth fell pregnant with her final child. It was unexpected when Elizabeth went into labour, as the baby was not expected until a few weeks later. So she would give birth in the Tower of London, where she was celebrating Candlemas with Henry. The small baby, clearly weak and struggling to thrive, was born on the 2nd of February 1503, the daughter named Catherine mentioned earlier who would live for only a few days. It had been a difficult birth for Elizabeth and she was reported to have been in great pain for most of it. She struggled to recover and on the 9th of February, Elizabeth fell ill. The following day on the 10th, Henry sent for a doctor from Plymouth suggesting at that point no one felt there was any urgency. It's now thought most likely that she had caught a pure peril fever a bacterial infection common at a time when people did not understand the importance of clean hands and equipment during giving birth. By the night of the 10th, she had worsened significantly, and it's clear Henry was panicked by this, sending for the Queen's personal physician from Gravesend, as well as paying for boatmen to hurry him up the Thames and horses with riders carrying torches to hasten his journey. Her doctor came as fast as he could, but he was sadly too late. In the early hours of the morning on the 11th of February, ironically her birthday, Queen Elizabeth died in the bed where she had given birth, just 37 years old. Henry appears to have been broken by the death of Elizabeth and her absence would haunt him in many ways over the next few years until his own death in 1509. He grew ill after she died and would only allow his mother Margaret to come near him. His miserly nature also increased after his wife's death without her influence. The country itself was also cast into deep mourning for its popular queen. The Vaux Passionel, an illuminated manuscript that belonged to Henry, reveals the aftermath of Elizabeth's death. Henry is in mourning robes, his expression grim. His two daughters wear black veils over their heads and red-headed Prince Henry weeps into his mother's bedsheets. Elizabeth's death would also affect her son Henry for the rest of his life and his obsession with finding the perfect wife may have begun with placing his deceased mother on a pedestal no other woman could reach. And finally, the Tower of London would never again be used as a royal residence. Elizabeth of York was one of the quietest of the women involved in the Wars of the Roses. She didn't start a war, didn't cause a scandal, and was known as a softly spoken and gentle queen consort. 
and yet her very existence would help seal the wounds caused by her ancestors' claims to the throne of England, as well as securing the country's stability alongside Henry VII. Her gentle, kind nature was the perfect complement to her husband's more serious, miserly nature, and she no doubt influenced him from behind the scenes, as well as fulfilling her duties as Queen Consort perfectly. She had been a well-liked and popular queen with her people, and she would be remembered as a paragon of queenly grace and humility. Although she only lived to be 37, Elizabeth of York had a full life that endured great tragedy, but also great joy, becoming a mother, a wife, a symbol of hope for Yorkists and Lancastrians alike, and becoming the queen she was always destined to become. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.